Good morning, good afternoon and good evening everyone. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome, wherever you are in the world, to the Institution of Mechanical Engineering Aberdeen Area webinar today. I'm Tegwen Northam, I'm a volunteer committee member here in Aberdeen, Scotland. Shortly, we will be lucky enough to hear a presentation by Alex Algaros, where you will learn about mooring integrity management, both in the oil and gas and floating wave, tidal and wind energy sectors. The webinar will present the key principles intended to help improve the reliability, availability and safety of the systems, whilst creating the potential to reduce inspection costs over the life cycle of the asset. But before we begin, a few housekeeping things. Your microphone and camera will be turned off by us throughout the duration of the webinar. On the top right hand side of your screen, you will see an overview tab, which will contain some relevant links at the bottom. Everybody who has registered for this event will receive an email which will give them admission to the recorded webinar, which include access to these links. The webinar will also be saved on our iMechE YouTube channel for viewing at a later date. We ask you to type your questions into the question box at the top right hand side of the screen. At the end of the presentation, we will have some time to answer a selection of these questions. We will try to get through as many questions as possible. However, it may not be possible to answer all of them. We have a short survey which will pop up at the end of the webinar. We would be grateful if you could take the time to fill it in to help us with organising future webinars. Before I hand over to our presenter for today, please allow me to make a few words of introduction. Alex Agaros is a chartered engineer with IMRST and holds a PhD from Cambridge University for his work on ultra-deep water mooring analysis and model testing, which has been published in several academic conference proceedings. He joined DNV GL in 2012 and is currently the lead naval architect, specialising in the design and approval of mooring systems used in floating wind, wave, energy, tidal energy and oil and gas applications. As technical authority for moorings at DNV GL's Noble Denton Marine Services, he has an active role in the development of engineering standards. Alex's presentation today is titled Mooring Integrity Management, Preventing Mooring Line Failures. Over to you, Alex. Great. Um, thank you for the introduction, Tegwen. So yesterday I'll be talking about mooring integrity management. Um, I saw this nice start off with a quote, and this is from uh, a chief risk engineer at the Navigators Group, which sums it up quite nicely. That design code compliance alone is not enough to guarantee mooring integrity. And this is predominantly because the actual probability of failure of moorings in service is higher than the probability of failure assumed by design standards. And when we study the causes of failure, we see that this is not just due inaccuracy or under conservatism in the analysis, for example, uh, underestimating the needed brake load of mooring components. These failures have actually predominantly come from unforeseen um, design or integrity issues, manufacturing issues, installation and handling challenges, and issues with the in-service operation. So it is now uh, more explicitly stated in the HSC information sheet that permanent mooring systems require an inspection maintenance um, system, and also for longer term mobile mooring deployments, a MIM system is required. MIM being the abbreviation of Mooring Integrity Management. So in this presentation, I'll um, then present on how the mooring industry is performing in general, how incidents, why incidents occur, and, and where is the mooring system most vulnerable, and what can be done to improve mooring reliability. 
the motivation for this is, uh, well, in the last 10 years or so, there have been several multi-million pound failure incidents of permanent mooring systems for floating production units. FPSOs are shown here usually lead to the highest profile failure due to cost of infrastructure and environmental impact. The first two in the top are in the North Sea. For the Griffin, uh, the root cause analysis showed that the failure was due to a combined thruster failure and flash butt weld of the chain, um, which led to poor quality. And for the Banff, it was undisclosed. Um, the other two in the bottom are in Southeast Asia, where vessels are subjected to typhoon conditions, and West Africa, where corrosion, corrosion can be a challenge. And I'll come back to this a bit later on. We also see failures of mobile units. Uh, here is the Bigfoot case study, which had collapse of the tendons due to failure of the connections between the temporary buoyancy module and the tendons themselves. And also when a production unit, uh, as shown here in FPSO, is in temporary phase. So in this case, the, the FPSO was moored up against the key side and experienced more than 30 failures of mooring lines in 15 days and had to continuously be replacing lines. So before I kind of get into the, the, the details, a bit on terminology. And we, we typically classify mooring systems into three categories, like broad categories, long-term or permanent moorings, uh, which are used in floating production in the oil and gas sector, normally have a design life of about 25 years, in some cases some life extension as well. We also have mobile moorings, which are a specific classification for uh, drilling or accommodation rigs, for example, performing offshore operations with durations of a few months up to uh, a few years. And temporary moorings, as shown on the, the third one, which, is, um, you, which are used in short-term operations, such as inshore or quayside, as the one shown. And it's important to note that the, the way moorings are designed and managed can widely differ between the options. And it is not, and so it is important to not confuse rules and requirements applicable to mobile and temporary moorings as to those for long-term mooring application. This presentation will focus on permanent moorings. And this is because this is where a lot of the MIM mooring integrity management development has been happening uh, in recent years but also because we're seeing a significant growth of use of permanent moorings in new applications, such as floating offshore wind, wave and tidal. All three of those industries have been in development for some time, but it is floating wind, which in the recent years has been growing rapidly. And there is a certain buzz about it in the industry, which is exciting. The second is an image of a computational analysis of a fish net and this mooring system. Here we're seeing fish farms move more offshore in harsher to harsher conditions than normally placed, for example, in fjords. And so we're beginning to see similar set of challenges as oil and gas and offshore wind uh, structures. Uh, also, the, the scale of these are becoming much bigger. And floating solar. Uh, this hasn't stepped fully yet offshore. Most examples of floating solar are inshore, like in protected harbors or inland like in lakes or quarries, but developers are beginning to look at offshore. Uh, in the presentation, that's going to be on long-term mooring, as most of the operation experiences experience is from oil and gas, the learnings I'll share are from that industry. However, I'll be drawing parallels and making links to floating wind, uh, which is in growth. So, uh, a bit on long-term moorings now. The re recent efforts in the industry to aggregate failure data show that for these permanent moorings, the probability of a single line failure per vessel per year is about 2%, and the probability of a multiple line failure, which could lead to the significant claims that I mentioned earlier, uh, is about 0.4%. And this is higher than the probability of failure set by the design standards, which is more around 0.4%. Well, 1% for a normal safety class. So this means that if we have 10 units operating over 25 years, half of these will experience a single line failure, i.e. one in every two units. One unit will experience a multiple line failure, and in two cases, there will be lost production. 
And it's important to note that for a floating production unit, capital costs of a mooring system, which may be one or two percent of capex, are relatively low when compared to the costs uh, required to address mooring integrity issues post installation, especially if there is lost production. So there is a strong case from a project cost perspective, um, capex and opex, that mooring line failure is addressed early in the design phase and risk is reduced. To relate this to floating wind, let's consider as a thought experiment a floating wind farm that comprises 50 10 megawatt turbines with 25 years design life. A typical mooring system, say for a water depth of 300 meters with drag anchors, and a purely catenary mooring is shown here with the gherkin and the millennium wheel for scale comparison. Such a system may have mooring legs that are approximately 1.5 kilometers in length, which gives about 225 kilometers of total mooring line length of the 50 turbine farm. By comparison, a floating production unit in the North Sea with 12 lines may have a total of 20 kilometers of mooring line. So there is a significant upscaling in terms of the number of units, but also the total length of line installed. As such, it's difficult to say whether the probability of mooring line failure goes up or down. It is prudent to, if you're looking at it as a on a unit on a single unit um, level, it, it is prudent to correct for the fact that a conventional floating production unit may have 12 lines versus a three-point mooring system that is usual in floating wind. So if we adjust the failure probability proportionally to the number of lines, this would translate to one in every eight units experiences line failure in its lifetime compared to the one in every two that I mentioned earlier. But let's take uh, installation error, for example, as a common cause of mooring line failure. It might first appear sensible to expect that failure probability will reduce when having fewer lines per unit. However, when considering uh, with a different lens, when considering the wind farm as a whole, there are more lines to install. Also, there may be greater use of mooring rope components which are particularly sensitive to installation, and I'll come back to this a bit later on. And there is less ability to retention mooring lines and floating wind farm platforms because um, fewer of them use uh, wind systems, for example. So consequently, the base probability of failure may actually be higher in floating wind farms. So because we don't know, let's just take a, a range. So this, and that's what's shown in the top right, that the operators, investors, and insurers of floating wind farms may need to plan for risk of mooring failure to between seven and 25 units over the lifetime of the, of the farm, which is quite significant. And whilst it is recognized that most renewable systems represent a lower risk profile than large hydrocarbon FPUs, single line failure can be more significant relative to the cost of the asset. So the associated costs with the number of mooring line failures, for example, the intervention, mobilization of vessels, repair costs, yard, yard costs, would severely impact OPEX and in turn at the LCO. And this may lower the growing confidence in the floating wind sector. So either the sector needs to effectively plan for this scale of mooring line failure or mooring failure risk needs to be lowered. So what, what is the reason for the generally high rate of failure of permanent mooring systems. Our offshore class perspective is that whilst design and manufacturing are generally good, more effort is needed in installation and in-service. In fact, installation is quite key as some failures, um, in some failure cases, whilst the root cause analysis showed that the in-service was, uh, was, the, was the failure cause, like let's say having too much wear between chain links. This may have actually stemmed from an installation problem. For example, there was twist in the chain causing the wear in the first place, but due to lack of proper documentation of the installation and rigorous survey, this was missed. And therefore the failure is wrongly attributed to in-service. And for floating wind, there may even be some more challenges. So for example, for design, Whilst we do have tools for the load and response analysis of the platform and turbine, we still don't have fully integrated tools that include the moorings and the cable. 
and certainly not for shared mooring or shared anchoring. Also, we see more shallow water mooring, which can be more tricky because there is less geometric compliance in the mooring system. And finally, the, um, the cost reduction has been driving novelties in mooring line types, such as using nylon, quick release connectors, or load reduction devices. Such novelty is okay because we do have ways to manage the risk, like using technology qualification, but still the additional challenges that these um, uh, produce should be acknowledged. For manufacturing, as I said earlier, there are more kilometers of mooring line to install, so there may be production capacity and storage challenges. And as well, uh, for novel materials, these need to be fully qualified for long-term mooring use. For installation, again, the larger number of lines means it may be more challenging to install to ensure consistency. So there is a greater need for installation oversight and designers to understand the installation process and also involve installation contractors uh, early on. And then for in-service, Inspection is more challenging due to the floating wind farms being unmanned and also the sheer scale of lines to be inspected. So there is a greater need for remote monitoring. The, the good news is that there is there has been a general consensus amongst operators for some time that there is a need to improve uh, reliability of permanent mooring systems. And there's a number of guidance documents that have been produced over the, over the years. Um, starting with, I, I guess I have a pointer, so it's the, um, the one uh, above the word floating and then working anti-clockwise. Uh, that's the API RP2I, and this one was one of the first MIM documents uh, which provides specific guidance for in-service of hardware, in-service inspection of hardware. It has practical and specific information for where and what to inspect, how many measurements to take, and so on. However, it's predominantly been written for mobile moorings, which, as I said earlier, are managed in quite different way to permanent moorings. To the left of that is the floating production um, mooring integrity JIP outcome, which was run by Noble Denton. And this was one of the first industry-wide initiatives to share experiences and address mooring integrity issues. The final GIP report published by the HEC is freely available and to, for download and contains extensive guidance based on in-service mooring integrity experience. Below that, the oil and gas UK mooring integrity guidelines are focused on floating production unit moorings, mainly in the UK, but also but the principles and guidelines are uh, applied globally, can be applied, can be applied globally. Detailed guidance is given on through life integrity management with practical examples to illustrate um, performance standards, which is a UK um, requirement, and a matrix based risk assessment methodology. Uh, to the right of that, the DeepSAR GIP recently completed a guideline with a guidance on inspection and risk management, and this has been transformed into the API recommended practice, uh, to an API recommended practice. Then in the back, it's the, the FUMA, the Floating Unit Mooring Assessment Guidance, uh, published by the Lloyd's Market Association. And this was created more for underwriters and brokers to better understand the risk of insured losses resulting from mooring system failures and premature mooring line replacements. It mainly provides guidance on evaluating the fitness for purpose of mooring uh, systems. Then, the top right is the, like, like for us, the DNV, we have the class rules and other class societies have their own rules as well. Um, and these provide prescriptive uh, inspection and survey requirements. But at least the message from our uh, class as well is that the, the, um, they are open and positive about having unit specific MIM programs. So this brings us on to the bottom right, which is the recommended practice. And this will be published later this year. And our focus is to develop a risk-based operator-led approach to MIM. And these, uh, once accepted by class, should uh, be able to uh, apply it in, in instead of the class rules. So I'll expand a little bit now on the recommended practice. 
the, it's structured into two main parts, um, MIM for existing units and uh, MIM for new units. And whilst the approach for existing and new units is slightly different, the backbone of the MIM approach uh, in, at DNV is, uh, is a risk-based lifecycle uh, process. So for example, let's say we have a new asset. At design stage, the risks associated with each life cycle phase are identified, evaluated, and mitigated. This may lead to design change to prefer, preferably eliminate the risk altogether, or implementation of specific inspection monitoring requirements to detect and reduce the risk. Here is where the MIM plan would be developed. And then as we proceed through the life cycle phases, the degree of understanding of the risks associated with a specific mooring system increases as information becomes more available. So the MIM plan would be amended and improved. So whether it's an um, existing unit or a new unit, the starting point is understanding the overall risk profile. And risk assessment methodologies vary within the industry and are often determined by an organization's internal practice. And all, ultimately, all risk assessment activities should be focused on giving input for decision-making. In broad terms, we have two types, quantitative, and this for mooring um, application, we think is for high-level decision-making, for example, uh, on investment, and considers the mooring system at the complete level. And qualitative, and this is for performing a detailed failure mode assessment that can be used to, to, to develop RBI, risk-based inspection, monitoring and maintenance and emergency response plans. So a little bit on quantitative. A QRA would be done early in the design phase to support decision-making and uses empirical failure probability data, as well as the distribution of probability by failure modes to assess the probability part of the risk calculation. And that is probability times consequence is risk. Consequence, in this case, is the monetized losses due to, for example, component damage, lost production, environmental or reputation impact. We've undertaken such work um, often for floating wind and wave energy projects, where there is perhaps more pressure to balance project financing with project risk and also as the assets tend to be closer to shore. So there may be increased risk with collision to other infrastructures such as um, subsea systems like cables or pipelines, offshore wind farms, onshore facilities. You can see how the consequence costs can escalate quickly. In, a, in this particular wave energy project, the mooring, shown on the right, the mooring system needed upgrading as the original system was using um, marine grade equipment with uh, some uh, low reliability designs. And in order to define a commensurate level of expenditure, we undertook the QRA, where monetary losses from lost production, grounding of the WEC and damage to the subsea cabling were included. Uh, there are, um, as I said earlier, different examples of QRA and some of these are event tree analysis, cost benefit analysis, and bow tie. Bow tie is shown here, and this approach, this approach creates a structured way to identify and visualize risk from initial causes like threats like fatigue or corrosion, through to fully realized consequences such as loss, production, or collision. In fact, it's kind of semi-quantitative in that the statistics and the actual monetary losses can be a quantitative risk evaluation, but the effectiveness of the barriers, so these are preventative or, con or um, reactive barriers to prevent or control the risk that are incorporated would be predominantly qualitative. So this is a useful way to communicate uh, risk for both expert and non-technical stakeholders, but as with all risk assessment, the effectiveness of the controls should be assumed with caution as it can give false confidence. Another way to depict the outcomes of a QRA is on a Whitman diagram. And this is, this is not a, a new thing. I think the original Whitman paper was from the 80s. 
and it, it plots economic consequence in the x-axis with probability on the y-axis and it basically it compares industry perceived risk of various assets for example mobile drilling rigs dams fixed offshore platforms aviation and acceptable and marginally acceptable risk levels can be defined based on the developer or underwriter expectations the lines shown here are from the original paper with the blue ones uh, inflated for um, up, up, upscale for for inflation so it can be used for example to uh, compare the risk of a particular industry like um, automotive industry or the risk uh, of NHS to sorry the risk the cost of uh, drinking to the NHS to other industries this this um, red blob here is uh, I think pre-COVID, I guess maybe now it's much worse. I don't know, or maybe less because no one's having fun. But um, yeah, I'm not sure on that one. Uh, or it can be used to uh, plot the historical FPSO failures, as mentioned previously. And in the Wave Energy project, we um, we use this to, to show the risk level of the WEC um, with the original mooring reliability equipment with the revised uh, mooring upgrades. So you can see how in the original condition, whilst the monetary consequence was much lower than floating production units in oil and gas, the probability was high and hence pushed the risk to an acceptable level. With a proposed upgrade to the mooring system to use long-term mooring equipment and the design process, the risk was manageable, so when this was shared to the financiers, it, it, it was enough to, to demonstrate the need to provide the capital. So now I'll go on a little bit on the qualitative approach, and let's say we have an existing asset. So in this case, we don't have the luxury of being able to change or improve aspects relating to the design, manufacturing, or installation because well, the mooring system is already installed. So here, the first step would be to understand the history. Uh, so to do the necessary homework to collate all the knowledge about the mooring system from design documentation, manufacturing data, installation records, and operational inspection monitoring data. And for each of these, it is then important to begin to identify high and low perceived risk items and then to move on to do the risk assessment. The method for the risk assessment follows the UK uh, Mooring Integrity Guidelines, the UK Oil and Gas MIG, which I'll come back to shortly. As this is a qualitative risk assessment, the, the key aspect is, is that the risk assessment is only as good as the people undertaking the risk assessment. So it is important here to have people with operational experience of the platform, in-service experience of mooring inspection, monitoring and maintenance, experience with historical failures um, of mooring systems, experience with hazard identification, risk assessment and barrier analysis, uh, mooring system design and analysis experience, and these people should have an appreciation of mooring failure causes in general. So, for example, we can categorize um, and, and collate causes of failure by geographical location to map common incidents. In the North Sea, the conditions are harsh a lot of the time. So consequently, fatigue combined with corrosion or bending is seen as one of the most common causes of failure, followed by component wear. High causes of mooring failure in West Africa and Brazil are um, fatigue combined with accelerated microbiologically influenced corrosion, AMIC, which attacks metal in the water column or on the seabed. In hurricane conditions such as Southeast Asia and the Gulf of Mexico, operational errors have also led to mooring line failure due to failure to disconnect in time. In addition, in Southeast Asia, common Failure mode has been wire abrasion and degradation, which may have been due to the designers not analyzing the full range of vessel offsets and potentially missing the wire coming into contact with the seabed. We can also categorize um, 
failures by location of the mooring system. The combined tension and bending fatigue seen in the North Sea failures typically occurs close to or at the fair lead. In the midwater column, uh, we've observed uh, fish, uh, issues due to accelerated corrosion or contact damage, such as with a fishing gear or ROV. At the touchdown point, uh, there's been observations of contact damage as a result of uh, improper survey, missing out boulders, or as mentioned before, due to wire rope being in contact with the thrash zone where bending and abrasion can cause relatively rapid failure of such components. Closer to the anchor, we have observed trenching and knotting of the ch anchor chain, which impacts the load path, and hence the calculated loading from the mooring analysis may not be valid. Most failures are due to chain than wire, but this may also be due to the more extensive use of these components. The oil and gas sector has actually done quite well to aggregate mooring failure data as much as possible. And when we see the breakdown of failure modes by component, the general uh, gist of it is that for chain, causes of failure vary, but typically it is long-term degradation mechanisms such as corrosion and wear coupled with fatigue as I've already mentioned before. For, for steel wire, fiber, rope, and connectors, the most governing failure cause tends to be installation error and then mechanical damage. Some examples of installation error are twisting. This can be due to uh, the vessel work wire used in series with chain or spiral strand, or in the installed mooring line having components with different torque properties. External damage, um, due to incorrect handling of the fiber wire rope, unauthorized repairs such as uh, tack welding of shackles, and an unrepresentative analysis of the as installed system due to, let's say, the anchors not being in the right place, the assembly of the connectors not being right, the system pretension, and so on. So, the, the, a key point here is that an as built survey is, is extremely important, even if the project is behind schedule and it's been pushed to to not be done. And because this is where a lot of the knowledge of the as installed system is, is collected and this, this ultimately forms a baseline for future MIM decisions. So all, all of this information and knowledge of the mooring system sensitivities regarding geographical location, type of platform and loading condition and then loading and, and failure modes by component are collated and used to define all the applicable failure modes by component or component groups, looking at the complete mooring makeup from fairly to anchor. The next step then is to generate the risk assessment matrix by identifying appropriate components given by the columns to individually risk assess for each failure mode given by the rows, where for each entry the risk is assessed qualitatively by undertaking workshops and considering the life cycle phases. Here we define improvement measures, which may be design change or additional analysis um, or inspection monitoring. So let's take the fatigue, uh, the top chain fatigue bending as an example. If say this exercise were done quite early on in the project design phase, mitigations may be further OPB type analysis such as FEA, possible change in the fairly design or even pretension relaxation, noting that if you have high pretension, this creates high interlink friction between chain links, which may lead to chain link bending. But let's say if the project was in service, then operational mitigations would be centered around inspection and monitoring. So for example, implementing inspection that looks at for contact between the top chain and side of connectors, which could indicate bending around the surface, or high abrasion between chain links, which could indicate high interlink friction. So these are what we call the target indicators. So then collating all of the improvement measures that come out of the risk assessment, this feeds into developing the MIM pack, which should comprise the design basis, uh, the integrity risk review, and then integrity plans for manufacturing, installation, in-service inspection, monitoring, maintenance, and emergency response. I'll now uh, expand uh, as a final part of the presentation a bit on inspection and monitoring. So the, um, for inspection, 
The benefit of understanding the risk of the mooring system at component level means it allows for instead of prescriptive annual and detailed surveys to be, under, to be undertaken, to develop a risk-based approach, which would be designed to optimize the frequency and scope of inspection to balance cost with component failure risk, where we differentiate risk based on location and component. This means available inspection resources can be utilized more efficiently than for a purely prescriptive approach, leading to greater reliability and OPEX reduction. It does need for a management system um, to collate all this information and also for the teams involved to have um, mooring competence and also competence of risk analysis. The development of, RBI, of an RBI plan at the design phase means that high-risk areas can be spotted and redesigned early on, so this creates a more reliable unit with potentially less inspection and intervention at the operational stage. You can see how for commercial floating wind farms, considering the scale, as I mentioned before, uh, RBI would really be essential to be able to deal with a number of lines. Uh, as this can use inspection resources more effectively by prioritizing high risk areas, grouping components or lines with similar failure modes and similar risk profiles, um, and also being adaptive to new information of the and knowledge of the system. So potentially, at first, maybe there's a lot of inspection, but as you gain experience, the inspection effort reduces, and this provides the framework to do that. And for monitoring, we typically will group it into two things in short term and long term. And short term is aimed at response validation, which is gaining confidence in the design assumptions based on real time vessel response and mooring tension data to validate our models. And the second part is having assurance in the monitoring systems themselves through calibration and correlation of the systems. So, for example, correlating data from motion sensors to mooring load cells. Um, Long-term smart monitoring is intended to having a real-time dashboard that provides readings of offset and tension measurement versus limiting criteria, for example, to trigger alarms, uh, or, or that could be for line failure or an overload, can be used to generally improve numerical models and flag unexpected responses, monitor fatigue, assist in inspection planning. So for example, let's say there are large tension variations. This could indicate large line movement and therefore where. And develop a reanalysis model. A reanalysis model should be updated at least annually. And this reflects the as is condition of the mooring system. This is common like you know typical SIM models for offshore fixed structures. And here we incorporate inspection data such as corrosion and marine growth and or when an update is triggered, like line replacement um, component. Sorry, component replacement. By having such a reanalysis model, it enables the operator to quickly assess the consequence of line failure and establish maximum operating conditions and damage scenarios, assess the consequence of modifications to the mooring system, let's say you have new inserts or components, carry out sensitivity analyses to advise on remedial actions. So let's say met ocean conditions change and plan for lifetime extension. For units where it may be difficult to have reliable tension monitoring, we can combine motion, motion sensor data with calibrated mooring models to train artificial neural networks to, for example, detect line failures or monitor fatigue. So I think that's the end of my presentation. I hope you found it useful, and I'll be happy to take any questions on this. Uh, on what I shared or uh, equally more wider uh, mooring related queries. Thanks. Thank you very much, Alex, on that really interesting presentation. And now we move to the question time. So we've got quite a few questions coming in and we're going to be asking them um, anonymously to Alex. So keep them coming in. So the first question we have is, is it possible that more abrasives in the seawater itself may be contributing to wire degradation in the Australian area? I'm aware of conditions in Korea, but less so in the area 
shown on your map, Alex? Um, I'm I'm not that sure on the kind of the statistics with Australia. I guess, uh, yeah, I think maybe that's sort of we, it would be. We can always um, touch base with the person later. I can try and ask our Australia office or something. <laughs> yeah, I'm not too sure I know that answer in relation specifically to Australia. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Alex. So the next question, what mooring technologies are, if, are preferred and are a digital twin of mooring systems a plausible idea? Um, so, yeah, I think the a, a digital twin of a mooring system is is kind of like having um, a, a mooring analysis, a mooring model, just run in real time, and that's something that, for example, we've we've already piloted for um, a, a, an operator or two. So I wouldn't go as far as to say that you need to develop a completely new platform or a completely new system. We already have tools. Um, such as Orcaflex or SEMA or whatever you prefer to use, which are um, reliable enough and proven enough. So maybe the question is, how do you use these with real-time data? And we've done some projects where we are using the cloud in order to run these models in, in real time. So that's like one, one side of it, which um, it's like a bit of like a digital twin. The other side of it is like is the risk the risk side and and, and tracking the the real time risk or maybe not real not updated every every second but it's updated grad, um, re repeatedly during the in service operation of the unit. And again, like we we have uh, that done in other technologies in other industries. Uh, of, of offshore structures where we're tracking the risk, so we can adopt that to to mooring systems as well. So yeah, it's it's not been as such uh, done uh, yet. In but there is there is a lot of work that's that's going into that, and I don't think we're far off. Thanks, Alex. Uh, next question. Is there one key change asset? Is there one key change asset owners could make in the in-service space, which would make a significant difference to their mooring system integrity? What would that be? I think if the unit is is in service and operating, then. Because it's a series system, so there are different types of components and different connectors, and it's it's difficult to just put a blanket mitigation across all of them. The the key thing is to understand the risk level and undertaking this type of qualitative risk review. And it, it's not that time consuming, uh, so it's. The, First is collating all the information with the installed system and then reviewing it against best practice. And that's that's kind of the, the point of the recommended practice that we will issue to be able to provide the mechanism by which one can do that. They can compare their in-service uh, unit and, and, and data against what is um, Good or bad, or good or high risk practice. So that that in itself is is a is a is a really valuable exercise, and it provides the the first step to then defining risk based inspection plans or focusing monitoring on certain areas, and so on. And that's uh, it's not a, it's a it's a largely desktop exercise which doesn't require anything any offshore work so from a 
cost perspective, um, yeah, it, I wouldn't say it's is that is that uh, owners. Thanks, Alex. Um, next question: What kind of non-destructive testing equipment being used for monitoring the structural health condition? So, what kind of non-destructive testing equipment is being used? For the monitoring of of the structural health condition. Um, I, so a lot a lot of the the survey uh, is done. So there is visual survey, and so general visual inspection, and that's that's normally done on an annual basis of of the accessible components of the mooring line. And then there is close visual inspection measurement, and that's done every five years on um, the complete mooring line. This is just uh, adopting the class rules. So on top of that, you can, if if possible, I, that there is like mar magnetic particle inspection, and that that can be used to uh, assess uh, fatigue cracking. And I, I, I'm, I think that's um, the ones I'm, I'm aware of uh, that you can do offshore. Like the, the issue is, is the mooring lines are in the water, so that there is a, there is a, a limit on, on what, what can be done, and it's generally observational and, and measurement changes. It's just measurement data that that, that is available. Okay. I, you know, if you can take something into the lab, it's it's a completely different story. Like when you do, when they do root cause analyses, you can do metallurgical studies and all that stuff. But the, I think, I guess the idea is you need to do this um, underwater in, you know, two hundred meters or something. Yeah. Next question, Alex. Um, you mentioned fatigue consideration. Does that include damage tolerance? Uh, crack growth. Mm. I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Uh, I, think, I think what he's referring to is, is monitoring the, the having some sort of crack already there and sort of monitoring it. Hmm. I think the 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 issue is you, you can't really uh observe um, the sort of it's not like a fixed structure where you have a bulkhead and there's like a crack and then you're monitoring the crack and you can put crack arresters like you drill holes and things and to, to prevent the crack growing this is not my area of expertise so I, I don't think you can do that with, with, a, with a chain chain link like ultimately if you've if you've got a crack that you can observe, then that's a close to failure. I don't think that chain link will be able to um, tolerate um, crack growth as such. So the, the, the issue is that the sort of cracks that would lead to failure would, would not even, I don't think that they observe. I don't, yeah, it's not like a bulkhead slowly cracking. So you can't really observe those, I think, in, in an offshore uh, underwater environment. So you just have to design sufficient fatigue strength in the mooring system to not require monitoring of fatigue cracking. So that's, that's why the fatigue safety factors tend to be a lot higher in the standards than the safety factors to ultimate strength. So the fatigue factors for for fatigue life are, are much, much higher. Uh, I think for that reason. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, thanks, Alex. Um, how can the twist in the chains be monitored remotely? What kind of signals are expected on the dashboard? Um, I'm not. Well, I don't think that's 
have been done yet. So I, I guess I don't know, or I'm not aware. I, I, I don't know the answer to that. The, um, the, the issue, so, so mon monitoring is, is very valuable because it can give you insight on, on some things like tension and movement, but it doesn't give you insight on other things which have to come through inspection, such as uh, corrosion, marine growth, and I guess twist might be one of them, because I, I don't see how you can monitor um, monitor for twist. So what we think is needed is is an integrated. If you go down this path of of developing a, a risk based approach to integrity management is you, you need to integrate the monitoring and inspection and it's not a either or so one can provide you one set of benefits another can provide you another set of benefits and yeah that's the way to think about it i think thanks alex uh next question it's about floating wind mooring systems. What do you see as being the highest risk for the coming generation of floating wind mooring systems? Hmm. Um, that's a really uh, it's a difficult question to answer. There's um, it's, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, there's a lot of challenges. I guess the the big the big step change is the number of units and number of lines being installed and then it's the remote uh, the need for greater remote monitoring the fact that i had done a quick calculation um once uh, if you just adopt the five-year detailed survey on the mooring system you, you you'd need to probably have um a vessel uh undertaking inspections in the 50 turbine farm i think half of the year in order to kind of cover all the inspections so it's like a lot a lot um uh, it's, a, it's a lot of time so i'm there is like a cost requirement to, to um to, to have a more risk-based inspection approach and of course if you're undertaking fewer inspections then that, that that brings in a risk so how do you manage that risk is is, is really key and then yeah having all these mooring lines installed which is a, a much larger uh, scale how do you ensure considering that a lot of in oil and gas a lot of the failures come from installation so that's already an issue and this is just getting a more a bigger issue because there's just more lines to install so it's it's uh, how do you ensure that uh, installation uh, how do you get the assurance in the installation phase and that that is a lot of it is is through early engagement with contractors i would say um and like marine warranty in the design process to ensure the the installation risks are reduced because there's no there's no good like installing an amazing let's start designing an amazing system and then it being installed incorrectly. So those, I would say those those are the key, the two focus areas. Thanks, Alex. I think we've just got time for one more question. Do you expect that future wind farms will implement redundant mooring systems? or stick with non-redundant three-line systems? Also, what is your opinion mm. on shared anchors for floating wind farms? My last question, Alex. Um, so, the, I, I guess, I, if we start getting more failures, or I mean, so not more failures. If we start getting failures, because we haven't got that data yet from floating wind, then perhaps that would that would be a, a reason to to go for more lines 
per unit. The yeah, the, currently that the standard al allows for non so for three three leg systems through the increasing consequence class. Um, so I don't see. If, if it's allowed by the standards and it's it, it's 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 cost effective, it's more cost effective. Then I I don't see why one would, um, from a, putting a developer's hat on, unless there is uh, the real risk of of drifting turbines. I don't see why one would um, change that. Um, and. So I think we'd have to see time and time will tell if we start getting many failures and potential collision incidents, then that might be revisited. And with with shared anchors, yeah, I, I, there are, I mean, there, there's two types. There's shared mooring and shared anchors. So shared anchors is where you have like a suction anchor and you have two or three lines going to one anchor. And that's already being studied. Um, and there is certainly um, it, it does seem like like a good option because it, it reduces the the number of anchors, so there's a, there's a cost implication and the the, the step change from what's normal. It, okay, there is a bit of change, like the anchor is needs to be designed for different load paths, and there's a bit of geotechnical impact, but it's not a huge step change. Shared moorings where you imagine you're using drag anchors, but you have like midwater buoys to create a web of systems to allow for shared mooring lines. We had actually studied that in a, in a research project with um, uh, Glasgow University. And yeah, it, it's again, it provides the benefit of reducing your anchors and therefore reducing your uh, cost, but it, it's slightly more complicated. There's a, there's a bigger step change from what's normal. So I think that might come a bit later, if, if at all. Okay, thank you, Alex. That was a great presentation. I learned lots, and I'm sure everybody on listening has learned lots as well. So um, I'd just like to take a few more minutes of your time, please, to make some announcements about our future events. On the mornings of Wednesday the 3rd and Thursday the 4th of March, we have an online conference organised titled Hot and Cold Assuring Fit for Purpose Joints, Welded and Non-Welded Connection Connections. The aim of this conference is to share knowledge and experiences of different types of hot and cold connections, including what to look out for to equip engineers working at all levels to be able to ensure joints are fit for purpose. It will address the pitfalls and provide tips and important tips, important things to look, watch out for up front, during installation and throughout the life of the joint. Conference sponsoring opportunities are available. The Society of Petroleum Engineers and the Institution of Mechanical Engineers, who are jointly organising this conference, are not-for-profit organisations. All surplus funds raised will be invested into the various initiatives to help support our future generation of young engineers. Membership surgeries. The next event after the conference will be our membership surgeries. These surgeries will provide guidance on becoming professionally registered or upgrading your membership. There will be a 30-minute one-to-one session with a business development team member and this will involve a phone call or a video chat. The surgeries take place on Tuesday the 9th of February from 10am to 3pm. To find out more information about these events and how to sign up for them, please go to our iMeki near you Aberdeen area website or LinkedIn page. If you're watching a recording of this on YouTube, you can stop the video and scan the QR code with your smartphone or tablet, and this will take you straight to the correct website page. So 
Thank you, Alex. As mentioned earlier, this and other webinars are saved on the iMeki YouTube channel. Also, as mentioned earlier, we'd be grateful if you could fill in the short survey at the end of the webinar, which will help us improve future webinars. Thank you, Alex, for presenting today and for all our participants for joining in from all over the world. We look forward to seeing you again at our next event, our conference starting on the 3rd of March. But for now, bye. Goodbye.